Snowboarding is more than strapping your feet to a board and sliding down a mountain of snow. It's a sport surrounded by passion, passion for the outdoors, passion for life, a desire to become the best individual you can be. I was first introduced to this sport in 2002, when the Olympics were held here in Salt Lake City, Utah. I distinctly remember watching professional writers Ross Powers, Danny Cass, and Kelly Clark boost out of the halfpipe. I had this overwhelming feeling of awe and inspiration. At the time, I was a 14-year-old sarcoma cancer survivor and amputee. Although I had been in remission for five years, I felt physically limited by prosthetic technology. The leg I'm wearing today is computerized bionic technology. But a decade ago, even that didn't exist. That is why snowboarding for an above-the-knee amputee was considered impossible. In my mind, finding a way to snowboard represented freedom from a life of physical limits. The knee is a powerhouse of the body. Everything we do, standing up, lifting, jumping, running, starts with the knee joints. Anatomically, it's a hinge flanked by tendons that help it to bend and return to its starting position. Its most basic function is walking. Prosthetists refer to the act of walking as a cycle called the swing stance phase. This cycle includes hill strike, rollover, toe off, and swing. Looking at this diagram, knee flexion is never more than 20 degrees in the support phase. This is important because it means that prosthetics weren't designed to bear weight past 30 degrees of flexion. Engineers use two types of technology to mimic the swing stance phase, hydraulics and something called magnetorological fluid. We could talk about prosthetics all day, but what you need to know is that these create a dampening effect, slowing down the speed of flexion and giving the user a sense of stability, even with the addition of microprocessors. Engineers can only work within the limits of the technology. Prosthetics, built for walking, aren't particularly good at anything else. For snowboarding, the angle of flexion varies between 30 and 90 degrees. A traditional prosthetic would collapse at these angles, especially when force is applied. Neither hydraulics nor magnetorological fluid have the ability to store and return energy the prosthetic I learned how to snowboard on didn't have any. It was locked at a 30-degree angle that would allow me to balance and turn the board. It didn't absorb shock, and it didn't bend when I would fall. It only allowed me to ride down a mild slope. It was a frustrating experience, and it could have been horrible, but I remembered that feeling of awe and inspiration I felt watching the Olympics. I liked the idea of doing something I wasn't supposed to do. I used that inspiration and sense of impossibility to keep trying. I mentioned that the knee is the powerhouse of the body, but it isn't because of the swing stance phase. It is powerful because the quadriceps enable it to absorb shock and withstand forces of physical activity. The quadriceps are a group of four muscles, four muscles that allow the human body to squat and jump, two basic functions of snowboarding. This sport took the swing stance phase and every prosthetic ever built and threw them in the back seat. The science of snowboarding from above the knee amputee is about finding the best way to mimic the motion of the quadriceps. Introducing the X-T9. 
The first energy storing prosthetic knee was designed by a friend of mine, Jerem Fry. He wanted something that would allow him to telemark ski. It looks like a mountain bike sack built into a frame. But what I see is my right quadricep inside a cylinder. I purchased one of the first versions of the XT9. And we discovered that because your feet are locked together on a board, it actually worked better for snowboarding than it did for skiing. Locking the feet in place helps to enforce body symmetry and gives the user better control over the prosthetic leg. The XT9 helped me progress my riding virtually overnight, but the simplicity of the design has its limits. What happens when you squat? The knee bends and the ankle follows. Forward flexion of the ankle joint is called dorsiflexion. This motion is often minimal in prosthetic design because it interferes with strength and energy efficiency during toe-off. In other words, artificial feet, like prosthetic knees, are only built for walking and running. To compensate for the lack of dorsiflexion, we place a wedge underneath the heel of the prosthetic foot. This creates a small range of knee flexion that helps to keep the body's center of mass over the board. When flexion falls outside of that range, mass falls either in front or behind the board. It's well enough balance. Balance issues create problems with responsiveness, efficiency, stability. So an athlete named Mike Schultz designed a prosthetic foot with dorsiflexion. Like the XT9, it's a shock built inside a frame. A simple design that helps eliminate these restrictions on knee flexion. So, by using mechanical shocks, we've been able to mimic the motion of the quadriceps and dorsiflexion of the ankle. But like knees built for walking, they aren't truly adaptable. These components need to be manually adjusted for different individuals, activities, and even conditions. For example, I am a border cross racer. Border cross is a competitive sport that involves multiple people racing through an obstacle course built on snow. The body position that I would like to achieve is low to the ground. Knee flexion is a 90 degrees. Dorsi flexion of the back ankle is a 30 degrees. And the hips are slightly rotated forward. Could I set a prosthetic up to be in that position? Absolutely. But I would be stuck in that position. <laughs> a few years ago, I received a grant to purchase a new prosthetic knee. I spent hours setting it up, testing different settings, and trying to mimic this dance. I was kid in a candy store excited, packed my bags, flew to Austria, but when I went to step on the board, I could barely stand up, let alone ride down a mountain. By trying to reach this level of motion, I sacrificed too much stability. I wasn't strong enough to physically compensate for the lack of prosthetic support. In the mechanical world, there is a fine line between stability and motion. To achieve one, you must give up some of the other. Finding a good balance is a very real and constant process in my life. I look at a situation and I instantly analyze how I can make it work. A month before the 2014 Sochi Paralympic Winter Games, I competed in the World Championships in La Molina, Spain. It was the kind of day that you dream about as an athlete, because I was riding well, and everything came together in the right moment. I won a bronze medal that day, and it is one of the most important wins of my career because I beat a field of athletes that have both of their knees. I proved to myself that even if I have to compromise more than other riders, 
I still have the talent and the work ethic to beat the best. Snowboarding has helped me escape a life of limits by giving me the opportunity to live it with passion. If all I wanted to do was walk, this bionic technology would be enough. But what inspires progress and change are individuals who are not willing to live within limits. Snowboarding has changed the face of prosthetic design by challenging the very definition of possibility. It is my dream to one day use a leg that is adaptable, a leg that can both walk and snowboard. I encourage you to be brave. Find your challenge and fuel it with passion. Do the impossible. Thank you.